I've got a big cup of coffee right here in this Saturday's story right on my screen. But before I begin, I want to let you know that I am very happy you guys are still here on Neckbeardia listening to these stories, as well as posting your comments, your own personal stories, your memes, and going to the Nerdbeardia page and getting on some more stories there. Always nice to see all you little animals out there. I do hope you guys are doing fine with the massive and super deadly virus rolling around and be sure to hide behind your TP force to make sure you stay safe. But besides that, let's go ahead and get started. Journal Entry 181 So the first thing to do in my investigation was to see who was selling my pins in the first place. Well, there are three merchants in town. Upon questioning them, and then questioning them harder, there's a small cottage industry on the edge of town that makes them a group of dwarves. So I paid them a visit. Of course, it's never that easy. The dwarves are only paid to make the pieces and assemble a finished product. They didn't even make the ink. That was outsourced to an alchemist in Rosenbridge who sends shipments every week. So who is paying the dwarves? Well, the dwarves are being paid by a merchant guild dispenser. It wasn't some rival artificer. It's the merchant guild, who have their hands in every merchant along the trade circuit. I questioned a few of the higher-ups in the organization that I could get access to, and they only knew that it came from on high. I'm also seeing that this guild is more like the Mafia. Great. Just fucking great. Journal Entry 182 I needed to clear my head, so I went on a dungeoneering expedition into the crypts with Avery and a group of fresh adventurers. We have a swordsman, a guy with a big hammer, and a halfling who won't stop talking about how amazing his magic knife is. We answered a posted request by some local who says that there's voices in his head begging him to retrieve some magic sword down there. Working for crazy people, but crazy people with money. Well, my solar battery flashlight still works fine. Avery was stuck with a torch and nearly set her hair on fire multiple times. So it's swampy as fuck down here because of the season. And surprise, lizard people, tribals. Why are they down here? They've been displaced by a group of druids who decided that they weren't natural enough to live there. The crypts are swampy enough to remind them of home, if not darker. And it's warm down here for whatever reason. So do our non-Terran teammates wait to find this out? Nope. They draw their weapons and charge in to slay the monsters. For fuck's sakes. No one was hurt. The lizard shaman did some magic thing to demotivate them. We talked and, to my surprise, there was a magic sword down here. Something they've been guarding. A great evil blade that's possessed. As Avery was a cleric, they let her see the blade and she confirmed that it was radiating evil. I didn't feel anything whatsoever. The shaman asked her for help in trying to purge the weapon, and she of course accepted. So that left the rest of us sitting on a rock and chatting it up with the lizard people. The adventurers were depressed that they didn't get to kill anything. After what felt like hours, Avery comes back with the now less evil blade and we get the hell out of there. We deliver it to the crazy guy who was relieved and then we got paid. Now, I need a bath. I smell like lizard person. Journal Entry 183 I found out who is head of the Merchant Guild. A gnome family has been running it for generations. Getting to them isn't easy. They always move with bodyguards. I can't just kill them. They are Baldi's main source of income and if they go down, so does the regional economy. They usually hang out at one of the high class cafes in town and drink imported coffee while discussing how to increase profits. They have the whole cafe shut down in the meantime. So I got as close to them as I could, slipping into the second floor of the cafe, the owner's apartment, and did my best. I gave them all guilt. It should take some time to bake, but it's pretty deep-seated. I also gave one of their bodyguards some delicious greed. Small pushes. We'll see how this works itself out. In other news, Avery stopped reading my journal. It doesn't matter where you hide it, I'll still find it. Journal Entry 184 So I had time to go through our recently acquired first-gen nook. 
Mostly fiction, including the entire Dune series. More Star Wars than I even thought possible. A man or woman of taste and refinement. My goodness. The Song of Ice and Fire series, Mistborn, and of course, Shakespeare. He also had a huge encyclopedia on there. Well, at least we have something to keep ourselves occupied when we're bored. I don't imagine publishing any of these on this world would be worthwhile. The common people are mostly illiterate, and I don't think anyone even knows what fiction is. What is fiction to a world with magic? World without magic? Anyways, we leave tomorrow. Our route is to hit the trade roads to Airedale, then to Pinecliff, hop on a boat to Valmere, and then we should be able to get to Sesbron. We have a long road ahead of us. Marcus and Jason are getting supplies. Avery is blessing the horses or something. I'm going to pay a last visit to my favorite skinhead and then we'll leave in the morning. Journal Entry 185 Alright, so we're riding along at a good clip and stumble onto a trade caravan in the process of being robbed by some bandits. It looks like the caravan guards were taken by surprise. Two of the five are dead, and the dead don't look like they even managed to draw their weapons. We have about 15 or so bandits. Too many to easily deal with. Of course, the bandits are seeing more money in their future and demand everything. Mike suddenly rides out front turns jet black and starts throwing his fire around. He gets hit by two arrows which just bounce off. After recovering from our surprise, we join the fray. The guards get the idea, grab their weapons and join in too. It's a huge fucking clusterfuck. Mike's horse freaks and tosses him, fire going everywhere. I manage to keep mine steady and start firing with my sig. Avery's horse flips its shit and starts trampling and kicking anyone who gets near. Marcus manages to dismount and go in with a sword. When all was said and done, we've all been injured in some way. The caravan lost probably half its cargo, and I'm down a magazine in my pistol. Avery's burned herself out healing everyone and the horses. I'm burned out keeping the horses calm and keeping the caravaners from deciding that we're responsible for their lost goods. The bandits had no money to loot. Shitty weapons, and pretty much nothing of value. Marcus claimed a bow and a quiver and wants to learn to use it. None of us have any archery experience. Currently, we're camped out at a caravan rest stop and we'll head out in the morning. We'd have made it twice as far if it wasn't for those fucking bandits. Journal Entry 186 Well, the ride took longer than expected, but welcome to Airedale. One of the minor port cities and a hub on the trade circuit. The city is of stone buildings and tight claustrophobic alleyways. According to the local sources, this town was built with small streets to make it easier to block them off should the population revolt. The area used to be under control of an asshole duke. The population revolted anyways and the duke couldn't escape because they blocked off the small streets. They're all long gone and the city is borderline anarchy. The only thing keeping the peace is merchant guild paid guards. I would say that the guild runs the town, but they don't actually have an office here, so it's a guard run town. There are some really strange and specific laws, and even harsher punishments. To make things worse, there are four guard captains, and they're all scions, and all mind linked at all times, and operate as one being with four bodies, and continually check in on their subordinates. Jason says there isn't even a thieves guild present. We're being careful here and have set up in an inn. We'll leave in a day. Marcus wanted to check out the Bard's College that's supposedly here. Why do they have a Bard's College here of all places? Journal Entry 187 Well, I'm never coming back here again. We were all fined and run out of town, one at a time. I was picked up by a guard while eating breakfast at the inn. What for? Being a scion without a shaved head. Motherfuckers. Avery got kicked out an hour later for being a cleric without ecclesiastic travel papers. She doesn't even know what that is. Mike got picked up soon after for abuse of magic devices. He was playing his iPod too loud, apparently. Marcus was booted for not having a bard's license. What? The only one that wasn't booted was Jason. The thief is the only one that didn't get kicked out of town. 
How? He fetched our horses and we left this shithole. They tried finding one of the horses for having two different types of horseshoes, but we were already outside the city limits. Anyways, we're camped out and on our way to Pine Cliff. We should be there in three days. Journal entry 188. Okay, I've been reunited with my journal. We get to Pine Cliff at nightfall and settle at an inn for the night when some asshole wizard who somehow knows we're off-worlders walks up. Some spell he has going. I figure he wants to talk and I can't easily penetrate his mind. He's got a strong will. I'm tired and don't think anything of it. It's happened before. Next thing I know, I'm on my ass with some paralyzed spell and he's running off with my journal. The others are too surprised to do anything except Jason who gives chase. Jason eats a lightning spell for his effort. It's on now, motherfucker. The spell wears off and Avery manages to heal Jason. We track him down to a tower on the edge of town after asking around. It's all locked up and has a mud golem parked out front for security. The lights are off. I know he's in there. I can feel it. There are some windows a few floors up, so we hatch a plan. Jason and Mike will go in while Avery, Marcus, and myself try to distract the golem. So we go up to the golem and engage it in conversation. It can't answer back, obviously, but it's not attacking right off the bat. It's in the middle of a city. But we got its attention. Jason scales the wall and Mike does the same thing where he just skitters up the wall like it's nothing. <laughs> what the fuck? Suddenly there's some loud whistling sound and the tower's lights go on. The golem suddenly flips its shit and turns to the front door. I think they tripped a magic security system or something. So we attack the golem. Swords aren't doing much to it except cutting off little pieces. Guards come running over, and I convince them that the golem's gone on a murderous rampage. They never trusted the thing. We have some help with this now. We're all covered in mud, but we're cutting this thing down until it finally goes inert. We're all covered head to toe in mud, and the whole area is filthy. Mike and Jason go leaping out of the window with my book, and the wizard comes running out the front door with a big glowy staff and cursing. The guards immediately leap on him thinking he's also gone on a murder spree. Accusations get thrown around, and we all get arrested except for Jason and Mike. We spend the night in jail except Avery, who is sent to a local sun church for them to deal with. We end up sharing a cell with the wizard. He thought my journal was some planeswalker spell book and was trying to decipher the language. He burned the edges of several pages in his attempts. He said it was the chance of a lifetime, and I'm at a fucking loss. Journal Entry 189 So the guard has us, wizards included, cleaning up the mud from the golem fight. We had some time to get to know each other. He's eccentric, but not a bad guy, really, when he's not stealing mysterious journals from strangers. He's originally from Alien and knew of some of the people who worked with me there. We asked if he knew anything about our missing compatriots. He did recall a strange band passing through a while back, so I think we're on the right track. Afterward, he invited us to a nice breakfast and bid us farewell. He has golems everywhere in his tower. So we picked up Avery. The church was pissed at her for being involved in criminal activity, even if it wasn't really. They had her do some thing that she won't talk about, but it bothered her a great deal. She was certainly directing hate around the room when we picked her up. She won't talk about it, though. Met back up with Mike and Jason. I'm pretty sure they read through my journal, though. But I don't mind, since they were there for nearly everything described in it. Not like you, Avery. Fuck you. You ditched me in a fucking church with Alex to go on an adventure. What was I supposed to do? Journal Entry 190. Alright, time for a proper introduction. Welcome to Pinecliff. It's a major port town posed on a cliff overseeing the ocean. The area is heavily forested and another hub on the trade circuit. Most of the buildings are wood and the primary export is wood and wood products, much like Brightly, but on a larger scale and without infinite trees. Instead, they have a pack of druids that decide which trees are good to cut and where to plant the new ones. No clear cutting here. The city itself is around 150-200 feet above the waterline where the massive harbor is. There's a long line of stairs to get down there and a crane system for moving the cargo. Jason mentioned inventing a counterweight elevator, but we're not going to be here long enough. 
They have enough docks for 20 or so ships, and most of them are full. They are also in the process of building an airship port. We're going to stick around for a few days until we find a ship heading to Valmir. Other than the wizard incident, our time here so far has been pretty good. Nice town to be in and Marcus is having the time of his life showing off the taverns. Avery seems distant though. Journal Entry 191 Well, a call went out for adventurers to help with dealing with a nearby dungeon of some sort. Unfortunately, we're the only ones in town at the moment, so we kind of got press ganged into it. It pays well, I suppose, and we are running low on our money. The Merchant Guild wants this place cleared out. It's full of goblins who have been attacking caravans, harassing the druids, and stealing anything left alone outside of town. We're getting prepared for it. Got some dungeoneering gear, rope, torches, emergency rations, and we'll tear it up tomorrow. Journal Entry 192 The Pine Cliff Dungeon Where to begin? We found a location and went in. It looked like just a natural cave at first, but sure enough, we found goblins. Ferals. No negotiations here. They attacked like wild animals defending their home, which they were. They had spears and primitive knives. We had swords and magic. Avery kept us healed as we pressed forward. Jason picked out a few primitive traps and I mind tricked him into tricking them for us. There were about 30 or so of them and they attacked in small skirmish groups. Probably would have had a better chance if they rushed us all at once. We took a break in their main camp after we finished, catching our breath and checking injuries. Around then, Marcus notices that the walls aren't so cave-like anymore. It's stonework, and the further it goes, the more developed it becomes. We make a decision and continue down to see what's there. We put up some chalk marks on the wall so we don't get lost. Jason picks out a few more traps that were far more advanced than what the goblins were using. Some of them magic. One insidious pit trap with some kind of monofilament line across it. Mike did his wall crawling thing to get across and found some trigger that exposed a pit with a mechanical door. Very interesting. So deeper we go, avoid some more traps, and we're currently taking a break and having some lunch. Airflow down here seems okay considering how deep we must be. Might be magic. Might be hidden vents, or just the design of the place. Journal Entry 193 We're not the first ones here. We finally make it to what seems to be the end of the dungeon. A big room with treasure chests. They were all empty, most broken open. We are about to shrug and then leave when Jason notices that a small floor tiles have something carved into them. Words in English. Here. It wasn't a message though. The words were random. Jason, of course, found the trigger. Pressing down on the earth and home stones, a new door opened in the wall and beyond a small alcove. We found a jar of honey with a small block of some kind of wax inside. In the middle of the wax was a micro SD card. When we touched the jar, a bright light burst went off. We thought it was a trap initially, but nothing seemed to have happened. We made a rush out of the cave expecting it to have closed off somehow, but we made it out okay. So what was that light burst? As soon as we got out, we made camp and checked the card. It still worked. It was full of photos. Ten people in earth clothing in locations that looked vaguely familiar. One was definitely alien, and one looked like Wolf Lake but was under construction. The first ones looked like Rosenbridge without a city on the bridge. There were 200 photos, and as they went on, people went missing from them. Expressions changed. They changed over their time. Like us. This had to have been in that cave for a long time. Why is there no record of their exploration, and why did they appear so long ago? We took a look at the dates on the earliest photos. March 3rd, 2014. Journal Entry 194 We got paid for our dungeon work and retired to the inn. We kept going over the photos. I sent copies to everyone's devices and we dug around for a message in the photos. Anything. Why is there no historical evidence of them? We tore through Aegean's University Library. How long ago was this? What happened to them? 
The last photos were of the dungeon. Was there a group before them? Is there going to be a group after us? Who is doing this to us? So many questions, and my head hurts. Avery's tearing up the more she looks at them. Mike's been messing with her laptop to see if there were any recoverable deleted files on the card. Marcus caught something, though. Their group had ten people. We have eleven. Why? Is there a reason behind this, or just random? I wonder if they ever found a way home. Or if they died in obscurity. Did they introduce technology the way we have been? What were their names? Damn it. Journal Entry 195 We held off the boat trip and went back to the dungeon. We brought digging tools and went to make damn sure that we didn't miss anything. Unfortunately, we didn't. We tore at the walls, the floor, the ceiling. We repaired damage in the last room that we did and resealed the alcove doors with a message written in chalk on the wall. It listed all of our names, even the dead, the date we left, and the current date. We resealed the micro SD card in the wax and honey and put it back. We added a new directory to it full of our pictures, a summary of our misadventures, the local date, and an explanation of all we know, where we've been and what we've done. If there is another group one day, I hope they find this. We resealed it and Jason reset the traps as we left. We spent the rest of the day in Pine Cliff in silence. Journal Entry 196 Well, we're on a ship headed for Valmir, another port city on the way to Zebron. It's a cargo ship, frigate size. It's an odd design to it, almost like a Chinese junk but with more traditional sails, but not quite. We have been following the coast and the waters have been calm. We have about a three day sail before we get to our destination. The crew is a mixed batch of races. The captain is a swashbuckling, civilized kobold. It's adorable. Apparently, most people don't take him too seriously, so he does all his dealings through his first mate, a numbers-obsessed elf who's always calculating the profit margins. Marcus picked out something in the photos while going through them. There's a few photos of one or more of the other Terrans posing in front of some churches, pointing back at it with an excited or silly expression. He seems to think they're under construction. That's one way to date the pictures, I suppose. The ones I recognize are the Sun Church in Wolf Lake, the Warrior Church in Wild Lake, and one is definitely the Peace and Love Church in Aeon. Maybe the university archives were the wrong place to look for the information. Next time we're in those cities, aside from Wolf Lake, I'll have to take a look. Assuming they don't brand me for evil or something. Journal Entry 197 I had a long talk with Avery. We were alone, the others asleep. Finally opened up with what's been bothering her. It's all a fraud. The churches. She says the gods are there alright, and she's a strong believer in whatever the sun god stands for. But the gods are like tools. They can be wielded, and they don't necessarily care how they're wielded, just that they are. The church, while it started as an organization to help people the same following and spread the love, has become a bureaucratic nightmare that exists solely to support its continuing existence. The church and its god have become separate. It's become a guild. She believes that if she separated herself from the church, she'd be labeled a rogue traitor and hunted down and purged. Why did she join in the first place? They have very convincing recruiters, and not all of them are bad. So what have they done to her? Word spread that she's an off-worlder. Some took that to mean that she was divine in some way and have been trying to take her for their own. Some have tried by force, but her power has let her resist and block such attempts. Why did she do what she did to me in Wolf Lake? She was appalled at what I've been doing, but also needed someone there she could fall back on. She used approved church methods to keep me there since she couldn't have an evil scion running around. And I ditched her. <laughs> Twice. That's why she never escaped during the war and returned. Wolf Lake has a particularly bad church, and she believes that it had been infiltrated and destroyed from within by a group taking advantage of the situation. Journal Entry 198 Welcome to Valmir, the Dwarven Port City. One of the many cities on the main trade circuit and the main Dwarven Port in their territory. Luckily, they thought ahead and made their doorways human height. 
but all the chairs are dwarf sized. So the city is all polished marble and open air, with encrusted statues of historical figures. It has a 20 ship port set into a massive stone carved bay, and they regularly dredge by magical means. Two airship ports on either end of town, and a massive indoor trade caravan loading and unloading and distribution station. Oddly enough, the city's major produced export is fish and shellfish. The city has huge fishing fleets that go out daily. Not what you'd think from dwarves. The real wealth comes in from the fact that almost all dwarven goods pass through this city on its way out. And dwarven goods are highly sought after for quality and design. The city's most well-known feature, however, is the mechanical defensive wall. The city has a 20-foot steel reinforced wall that sits underground and can rise up mechanically on demand should the city be threatened. When not under threat, they keep it down to allow the winds to blow through. Journal Entry 199 Says Braun is about 6 days by horse or 2 days by airship. So we're going to try our hand at the airship ride. We've had a 50% success rate with those, so <laughs> why not? The problem is that's going to cost nearly all of our money. That's assuming we sell the horses at market value. Avery's pretty against Jason and me doing some B&E jobs, or me running around grifting people. Or the classic taser in the alley trick. Either way, it's not something we have to worry about until we get there. In other news, this place has several bathhouses and we're all dirty. And stink. So we paid a visit. Got clean. Got our clothes washed, and now we are feeling fresh. I noticed that I have a collection of scars now from all my fights, and apparently clerical healing won't get rid of scars. That's some kind of other regenerative healing. Anyways, Jason ran off to pay a visit to his guild. The rest of us slummed around town seeing the sights. This seems to be a nice town if you get past all the dwarves running around. Nothing wrong with them, and they're quite friendly. It's just odd towering over nearly everyone in town. Journal entry 200. 200 pages. How long have I been here again? God damn it, now I miss home again. So we got our airship tickets. We leave tomorrow. Mike suggested that, since finding the photos, we should start checking around cities for any other signs of previous Terrans. So we paid a visit to the city's archives. They are, unfortunately, written in Dwarven. A language I am not going to learn because fuck it, common was hard enough and this is written in two dialects. We did get assistance from an adorable female dwarf librarian who was familiar with all the records. Of course the records don't keep track of everyone passing through, just important events or noticeable occurrences. No sign of strange foreigners who would fit the description, and we checked back for a thousand years. The only thing that caught our eyes was an occurrence around 400 years ago. The sudden use of the modern ship design, sloops, catches, schooners, junks, and the use of triangle sails. Before that, everyone was apparently using something similar to long ships and triremes. It's possible that this is a case of Terran intervention, or it could be just a natural period of sudden innovation. Journal Entry 201 We are on the airship, and it's more of a large barge. It moves along at a slow but steady clip, and we should be at our destination in a day and a half. The airship wouldn't be worth mention except for its very interesting autopilot system. It's got a load of enchantments set to home in on certain items. There is one at Sesbron and one at Valmir. The helmsman doesn't even bother sitting at the wheel unless we're near town. If we get blown off course, the ship reorients and continues on its way. It can't land on its own, so it's not fully automated, but it's damn impressive. It's crewed mostly by dwarves and some humans. The captain is a female dwarf with a taste for gambling and alcohol. I'm okay with that, as long as we don't crash into something. Anyways, we watch Strange Days again, and discuss what we're going to do after this. We are going after our Terran friends, but truth be told, we don't know these three very well. We only knew them for a little over a week before they were captured. It was a life-changing period, but still not very long. It doesn't matter though. We're still going to do everything in our power to rescue them. They're Terrans. They're our brothers and sisters. They deserve better than to be some wizard slave. I just hope they're still at Sesbron and 
still alive. And that's the end of this chapter. I wanted to end on 201 to avoid, you know, a massive cliffhanger. But yeah, uh, like I said before, I'm glad y'all are sticking around. I'm glad y'all are enjoying the story. And hopefully I may have Avery back again when she's in work and is around me when I'm narrating. <laughs> As always, if you like this story and others like them, be sure to like and subscribe to Neckbeardia. Join the Discord, join the Reddit, stop by Nerdbeardia, hear some more stories, and hear more of me. This has been Garbo, and I will see you next time.